I'm going to try and do today is to share some of the work in which I've been involved for the last 12 or 13 years or so. And not surprisingly, given the title, the focus or the question we sought to address is what does it take to improve the quality of math teaching, and thus student learning, on a large scale? And I'm going to start by giving as short an overview as I can, but it's tough to do, of the MIST project, project involved with, and the goal of that project, just to be clear, was to identify potentially productive instruction improvement strategies. The sorts of strategies that might be implemented at the school level or a system level. And then to share some of our findings concerning these potentially productive strategies. So we want to identify strategies, what the high quality implementation looks like, what are some of the conditions that influence the quality of implementation, and so on and so forth. But before I do, I need to say just a few words about the US education system. Two couple of points only. The first is it's a decentralized system. Each US state is divided into a number of independent school districts. There are 13,500 school districts in the US. Each one has the primary responsibility in for what textbooks, what materials are we going to use, how are we going to support our teachers' learning, all these sorts of things. All of that's at the district level. The small, many of these districts are very small rural districts. Our biggest districts are the city or urban districts, 100,000 students or more. So in the US context, when we think about instruction improvement at scale, the biggest administrative unit it makes sense to investigate are these large city districts, okay? And so that's what we attempted to do. The second thing to know are a couple of federal policies. The first one, and I don't know if this word of this filtered across the Atlantic, is called No Child Left Behind. It was passed by Congress in 2001. It mandates that all states have to establish standards or goals for students learning in math and English language arts at each grade level. And it has to uh, develop and implement tests for students in grades one and three through eight at the end of every year. The key point to note is these tests really matter. Each school is set a target which ratchets up year by year. If they fail to meet those targets, schools are closed, uh, principals are fired, and so on and so on. The assessments that were developed, sadly, were very procedural in nature. They didn't actually align with the state's own standards or objectives. So that was the environment in which we began working with this very draconian uh, procedurally oriented assessment system. In the last three or four years, there has been an introduction of a new set of standards where they're trying to align standards across states, the common core state standards. There's issues around moving content down into lower grade levels, but the level of rigor of the standards and the assessments has improved. Yes, there's procedural fluency, but also more of an emphasis in the assessments on conceptual understanding, reasoning, problem solving, and so forth. So I would say from our point of view, given our agenda, this is on balance good news rather than bad news. So that's the sort of background. So therefore, we work, have been working at the urban district level, and we began in 2007, and we've managed to establish partnerships with four urban districts that has served a total of 360,000 students. We worked with those districts for four years, and then at our choice, we decided to continue on for another four years with two of the districts, where the nature of our partnership work was closer. What about these districts? When we say urban districts in the US context, big stress, they have relatively limited financial resources. Why? Because funding of 
districts and school is primarily local. You had the inner cities versus the richer, wealthier suburbs. A high proportion of students from under, traditionally underserved groups. That means if you to go into go into a class in these schools, if it was low in our terms, it would be 50% of students were uh, of color or whose first language wasn't English, very common that it was up to 90%. High teacher turnover, high proportion of novice teachers. This is just typical. It wasn't just our districts, this was urban districts in general in the US. But we worked to recruit districts that were not typical in one important respect. In the face of no child left behind procedural assessments, they were aiming at higher level rigorous learning goals for all students. So these are pretty brave folks. Why were they doing this? It seems nuts, right? They were doing it because they realized that if kids were viewed as proficient on those low level tests, they would not necessarily get into college. And if they did get in, they probably wouldn't do well when they got there. So they were aiming high. They were attempting to improve the quality of instruction. That was atypical. Most districts were attempting to teach to the test or even worse, game the system. There were a few districts who were focusing on the quality of instruction. And they were attempting to implement reasonably coherent set of improvement strategies. For example, they understood that school leaders had a role in this and they were attempting to provide professional development for school leaders. The point is, because we recruited districts of this orientation, we as researchers could forge a common agenda with the districts as practitioners. And so this type of project, uh, we, start, we subsequently has become called a research practice partnership which in this sort of term became current about five or six years ago, not our invention, and I would say has become increasingly important and significant number of people, including funding agencies, are coming to see value in this way of working where we do research with rather than on practitioners, where it's a genuine collaboration. And it's something I will tell you, just put my values out there, I am very deeply Part, one of those strategies, which was important, three of the four districts had adopted instructional materials consistent with rigorous learning goals. And I mention this because of the emphasis on uh, task propensity. I was thinking of Kuno's presentation. Uh, in these materials, the lesson structures introduce or launch, would be the term typically used, a rigorous mathematical task. And rigorous here means challenging, conceptually challenging for students. This is no mean feat to do this well. Kids work on the task individually or in groups, depending on the task. And then there's a whole class discussion of student solutions in which the teacher presses students to explain their reasoning, uh, connects, makes connections between different solutions, and so on and so forth. Now, this is the basic structure. There's also, typically, in most lessons, a place for what are called number screens, which are very consistent with some of the mental arithmetic activities. Number strings refers to, I'm thinking of Hamster's presentation yesterday afternoon, with the sequencing of tasks, so that you have one sort of mental task, and then the next one is set up, so it's the possibility of using the previous result figure out the next one and so on. But there was a discussion of solution methods and so on and so forth. But that, you know, there can be variations of this basic structure. But that's the sort of basic idea. So against that background of the project of US context of our partner districts, what were our goals? We had two. Pragmatically, in the spirit of partnership, we worked to add value to the district's instructional improvement efforts. Our research goal was to develop, God help us, what we call an empirically grounded theory of action for instructional improvement. What the heck does that mean? Well, it means 
It's a set of policies or strategies for supporting teachers and others learning. And we say learning because if you have a policy and it's implemented, any time a policy doesn't just ask for more of the same, it involves learning. So we want to pull out and highlight the learning involved, and we want to analyze policies as designs for supporting learning, and we want to see to what extent there are supports for that learning, and so on provided. And it also involves a rationale that explains why it's reasonable to expect the policy or strategy to be effective, to lead to the intended outcome as well. So how did we get back in the day in 2006 we did reviews of the literature uh, to come up with some initial conjectures about what it would take to support instructional improvement at scale. The short story is once you move beyond the classroom, beyond teacher professional development and a little bit on teacher collaboration, there's, there's next there's almost no relevant research when you're aiming at ambitious or rigorous learning goals in mathematics. Uh, and the idea was in working with the districts over these eight years, we would test and would revise our initial conjectures. So that was the way of working. How do we work with the districts? For each district, we selected six to 10 schools that were representative in terms of their current capacity for improvement. We focused on middle grades, which is ages 12 to 14, so schools with middle grades. We recruited, randomly selected 30 math teachers from those schools in each of the, and this is when we had four districts. We recruited the math coaches. And I want to say what a coach is, this is a common position in the US and could be of interest here. A math coach should ideally be a really accomplished teacher and he or she is charged with supporting other teachers in a particular school building, improving the quality of their instruction, either by working with them one-on-one -on -one in their classrooms or working with groups of math teachers, perhaps all the math teachers who teach a particular grade level. It's a very common position. We, the school leaders and district leaders, system leaders across various units, I'm, not going to say a whole lot about school leaders and district leaderships in the rest of this presentation. But we ended up with 50 people, a district, 200 participants altogether. When we went down to two districts, we doubled the number of schools, of teachers, and so forth. So it was still 200 people. And we went through this cycle every year. In October, we went to each of the four districts, and I because of our criteria for recruiting districts, these were not local districts. The three of the four, we had to fly to them to get there. We interviewed about 10 district leaders, and we were trying to understand what are your goals for improving middle grades math this year? What are your strategies? What are you trying to do to make that happen? And we wrote that up in a what we called a district design document. It was about four pages, and we said, here's the first thing, strategy, did we get it right? This was critical. It was everything else we did that year was based around that document for that district. Then, in January, we went back to those districts and we began documenting how their improvement strategies were actually playing out on the ground in schools and classrooms and to what effect. Specifically, one of the things we did, we conducted audio recorded interviews with all of the participants, in those interviews, one of the things we're trying to get a handle on is if, what was it like to be a math teacher in this school, in this district? What were they held, perceived themselves to be held accountable for? By who? What were the informal sources of support on which they could draw? The formal sources of support for improving their teaching? What materials and resources could they use? And so forth whole bunch of other stuff as well. That was the stuff that we analyzed each year for our pragmatic goal of giving the districts feedback. In addition, we collected a bunch of other data for our research goal. So we had a complementary online survey for teachers, coaches, and school leaders that complemented the interviews. 
we video recorded two lessons in each of the 120 teachers' classrooms. So we ended up with over 1,700 video recordings, all of which were coded using a scheme I'll briefly explain. And Pete, do I need to explain mathematical knowledge for teaching? Or no? Okay. And so we used the mathematical knowledge for teaching instrument developed by Deborah Ball, Hyman Bass, and Heather Hill at the University of Michigan, and multiple choice instrument each year for all of the teachers and the coaches. Uh, we recorded uh, professional development, and in the last four years, that was professional development for teachers and for coaches and for school leaders. And we were involved in co designing and co leading that professional development for coaches and school leaders. Uh, we had uh, audio, uh, video recordings for the last four years of te selected teacher collaborative groups. So four or five times in about six schools, three in each of the districts. Uh, we also had access to all of the student achievement data. The districts gave us that for the teachers who were participating in the study. So we had a pretty large database that we were compiling for retrospective analyses. But right now, I want to go back to the cycle and how we collaborated with the districts. Between February and May, we interviewed, uh, we analyzed the 200 interviews. We had to do it pretty quickly because in the US, districts do their planning over the summer. Therefore, we had to give feedback to the districts by May at the end of the school year, if that makes sense. And what we were doing in these analyses was looking at to what extent, uh, what were the gaps between how the districts hoped their strategies would work and what was actually happening, and explaining why that was happening. And we developed a framework for developing those explanations, which we call the learning design framework. And against that background, we made actionable recommendations to each district on how they might improve their strategies to make them more effective. We wrote that up, so it's about a 15-page document, and we based it around those initial strategies or plans. Remember, at the beginning of the year in October, we'd interview district leaders and sent them a document saying, we want to check we got your strategies right. Then we said, for strategy one, here's how it's playing out, here's why it's playing out, Here's how we recommend you adjust it or whatever, and so on. And we sent that to district leaders, and then we went back and we met with them for two hours to talk through, not to present, to talk through our findings and recommendations. And these meetings ended up being quite a big deal. Now, notice, when we went back the following October and said, what is your strategies for this year, we could compare those strategies against our recommendations the previous May. We've done that retrospective analysis, and it turns out that across districts across years, they were attempting to, they attempted to take up and act on 67% of our recommendations. And if we told us we would get that at the beginning, we would have been thoroughly delighted. So we take that as some indication that we had success, or at least some success in our pragmatic goal. This will be a figure familiar to Kuno, I believe, and it's a characterization of the way of working. One way to look at this is that we are in effect doing four parallel design studies at the system level. Well, each of these is one of those yearly cycles. In design research, if you're familiar with the methodology at the classroom level, the cycles are daily. If we're working and doing a design study, to investigate teachers learning there from one professional development session to another. At the system level, those cycles are annual. The size of the beast, it's like turning the Titanic, so to speak. And notice it's a partnership in that there's a collaboration between researchers and practitioners on the enactment of the cycle. So we draw on the current version of the theory of action that informs the recommendations we make on how to improve the strategies. But when you're doing this work and you're dealing with a particular case and you have to take account of current district capacity and you've got to come up with a recommendation and it's already late April, that really helps concentrate the mind wonderfully 
and you figure things out specific to that case. When the dust settles each year, we then step back and said, does what we figured out for District B around school leadership, has that got any implications for District A or C or D? Maybe, does it have any implications for revising our theory of action, which then feeds in? So that was this sort of bootstrapping process of work, working our way up. And again, I want to say that the research on which we could build beyond teacher collaborative groups is really, really thin. And I've said this in the US, and I mean it, uh, I am sometimes embarrassed to be an educational researcher when I look at the types of decisions that school and system level folks have to make day in and day out, and they can get almost no guidance from research. And that became very clear to us as we went through this process.